Welcome to Lesson 1e, Kronecker Delta Function. In this lesson, we define the Kronecker Delta Function, and we'll discuss some of its applications. It's especially useful for doing dot products. I'll also do some example problems. First, a definition. We use the symbol delta, and delta ij is defined as 0 if i does not equal j, and delta ij equal 1 if i equal j. That's the simple definition of the Kronecker Delta Function. It's a second-order tensor, since it has two free indices. If we look at individual components and expand this, the components are therefore delta 1, 2 equal delta 1, 3 equal delta 2, 1 equal delta 2, 3 equal delta 3, 1 equal delta 3, 2. All of those are 0, but delta 1, 1, delta 2, 2, and delta 3, 3 are all 1, based on this definition. If we expand it out in matrix form, delta ij is simply 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. It's also called the unity tensor. In formal tensor notation, we write it as capital I, two arrows, equal delta ij, ei vector, ej vector, where these two are the unit vectors in the i and j directions. And this combination, as you may recall, is a dyad. The delta function is particularly useful when you're taking the dot product of two vectors. Remember from your math class that a dot b is the projection of a onto b times the magnitude of vector b. Suppose we have some vector a, which is a times ea, ea being the unit vector in that direction. Similarly, some other vector b is b times eb. This unit vector is ea, and this unit vector is eb. Let angle theta be the angle between these two vectors. By this definition, we need the projection of a onto b. That would be this portion, which is a cosine theta. So we write this as a vector dotted with eb, and the magnitude of vector b is just b itself. Vector a dot eb is a cosine theta, so this is a cosine theta b, or a b cosine theta, as you should remember from your math class, which is a scalar. Just a comment. The dot product reduces the order or rank by 1. We started off with vectors, and now we have a scalar. Now let's do what I call formal Cartesian analysis. Vector A is AIEI, and we dot with vector B, which is BIEI. But this is improper. From our rules for tensor notation, we have four repeated I's. So instead, let's use dummy index J for B. This one is proper. Now we want to move these around. We have to be very careful. ai and bj are just scalars themselves. They're coefficients of vectors a and b. So the dot product does not affect them. They could come outside of this equation. So a dot b is ai bj, ei vector, ej vector, with the dot product. This itself is formally a second order tensor. And what is it? Well, if we choose some Cartesian axes, we have e1, e2, and e3. These are unit vectors, so their magnitude is 1, and they're all 90 degrees apart from each other. If we take E1 dotted with itself, theta is 0 degrees, and cosine of theta is therefore 1. And using our old definition for a dot product, magnitude of E1 is 1, magnitude of E1 is 1, and this is 1. So E1 dot E1 is 1. Similarly, E2 dotted with itself is 1, and E3 dotted with itself is 1. But E1 dot E2 is 0. Looking at our axes, these two unit vectors are 90 degrees apart. Cosine theta is 0, which makes their dot product 0. Similarly, all other combinations of E's where the indices differ give 0. Thus, EI dot EJ, expressed as a matrix, is this, which is how we define delta IJ, as we see up here. So we have this nice little result that EI dotted with EJ is the same as delta IJ. This will occur often in our work, so this turns out to be very useful. Returning to our dot product of a and b up here, we can now write a dot b equal a i b j delta i j. But now think about this right-hand side. This right-hand side is 0 unless i equal j. When i does not equal j, this whole right-hand side is 0, and this therefore reduces to a i b i. Remember that we're summing over both i's and j's, but only those terms when i equal j will matter. The others will all be zero. So this is a much simpler form of this. We call this contraction because we've lost one of the dummy indices and have a much simpler equation. So finally, we can write that a dot b is a i b i. 
But, sir, I'm nervous because you're mixing tensor notation and vector notation, aren't you, sir? Good observation, Ned. Yes, I realize I'm mixing vector and tensor notation, but this is okay in this case because both of these sides are scalars. Let's compare this to what we learned in math class. You should recall that a dot b is a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus a3 b3. In tensor notation, that's exactly what you get when you expand this. So these agree. Again, it's kind of like learning a new language. From now on, when you see ai bi, in your head you should be thinking that's a dot product. Let's do an example. What is delta ii? Well, we're summing over the i's. So this is delta 1 1 plus delta 2 2 plus delta 3 3, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1 or 3. The answer is 3. Here's another example. What's delta ij delta jk? Well, we can make the same argument that we did up here when we contracted this. Namely, this is equal to the sum over j of delta ij delta jk. And this is non-zero only when j equal i and j equal k. And this can be true only if i equal k. So this reduces to a tensor that is 1 when i equal k and 0 if i does not equal k. So delta ij delta jk is simply delta ik. Again, this is a contraction. If you're not convinced, I urge you to write all these out, sum over all the j's, and you can prove this to yourself. This equation will also be very useful to us in the future. Let's do another quick example. Recall from lesson 1c, when we were rotating axes, we had this expression for the new axes using cosine matrices, where we're talking about the pressure component of the stress tensor Tij. These are the old axes or original axes, and these are the new axes. These are cosine matrices. I wrote this out ahead of time to save some time. After much algebra, we found that this term circled in blue was equal to minus P Cin. Let's redo this using delta Ij. Tij pressure has negative P on the diagonals and zero everywhere else, which is equal to negative P one on the diagonals and zero everywhere else, since P is just a scalar. Using our delta function, this is minus P delta Ij. So this term in blue can be written as Cjn negative P delta Ij, or taking the P outside the parentheses, we have this, which we can contract just like we did above and get Cin. So this term in blue becomes negative P Cin, which agrees with what we got previously, which makes me happy. Hopefully you're starting to see the usefulness of the delta function. Now I'll do some examples of the dot product in fluid mechanics. Recall from your undergrad fluids class the material derivative, also called the substantial or total derivative. We applied the material derivative to velocity vector u, and we wrote it out as del u del t plus u dot del u, where del is the del operator, which in formal tensor notation is del del xi unit vector ei, or we write it as del del xi in simplified tensor notation. So if this is the given information, what we want to do is write this expression in simplified tensor notation. First of all, recognize that it's a vector equation. You may recall that this is the left-hand side of our incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, which is a vector equation, which is also a first-order tensor. So in tensor notation, we need one free index. You can pick i, j, k, l, m, anything you want, but we usually pick i as our index. So how do we write this expression? Well, I would write it as dui, which is our vector dt, equal del ui del t, plus the dot product of u and del operating on u. This u is the one that must have the i index, the free index. This dot product will have a dummy index. I'll use j as my dummy index, uj for the velocity, and then del has component del del xj. That's an operator operating on ui. Here i is a free index and j is a dummy index. We don't really need the parentheses, and it's more common to write it this way, with this term becoming uj del ui del xj. So this is our answer. Again, after some practice, when you see a term like this, your brain should think of it as this. But eventually you'll start actually thinking in tensor notation. I'll do one more example. Let's take the incompressible continuity equation, which in vector form you may recall as del dot u equals zero. The divergence of the velocity vector is zero. Again, we want to write this equation in simplified tensor notation. Well, since it's a dot product, we can write del dot u is the del operator 
dotted with the velocity vector. Notice that I used i's here and j's here, so I only have two j's and two i's. Now I want to move some of these things around. I can rewrite this as del u j del x i, ei vector dot ej vector. As I said previously, you have to be very careful moving things around. I'll make some comments here. These e's, these unit vectors, are independent of location. They do not change with x1, x2, or x3, where we're talking about a given coordinate system. Therefore, del del x with any subscript or index of e with any subscript or index must be zero. I'm writing mathematically what I said here. The unit vectors don't change with location. That's why I was able to take the ei outside of this derivative when I put it here. As another note, uj represents the scalar components of vector u. From the dot product's point of view, in this expression, the uj can come outside of the dot product, which is why it ended up here. In other words, it's just a scalar component that is not affected by a dot product. The ei and the ejs are vectors. They are still affected by the dot product. On the other hand, uj is a function of space and time in general. Therefore, uj must stay inside the derivative, which is why I still have uj in the derivative here. These two are kind of opposites. Unit vectors e don't change with location, so ei can come outside the derivative. On the other hand, uj is a function of space and also time if it's an unsteady problem, so it must stay inside the derivative. But since it's not a vector, it can come outside the dot product, whereas the e's must remain inside the dot product. Our continuity equation using this can be written as del uj del xi dot product of these two e's equals zero. But recall that this combination is delta ij, so we can write del uj del xi delta ij equals zero. But we can contract this. Whenever you see a delta ij with some other indices with i or j, Keep in mind that this is 1 only when i equal j. So though we're summing over all i's and j's, the only ones that count are the ones when i equal j. So this becomes del ui del xi equals 0, or del uj del xj equals 0. We usually write it this way, but this way is equally valid. This is our incompressible continuity equation in simplified tensor notation. Again, after some practice with this, when you see this equation, you immediately recognize this as the incompressible continuity equation, because in your mind, this is equivalent to this. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.